In this video, we are going to look at the levels of measurement, and our goal for this video is to understand what the differences are between the different levels of measurement and also how to decide what level of measurement applies to a specific set of data. So the two graphics that you see on the screen right now are directly from your notes. At the top of the screen, we see a chart with the different levels of measurement, a place for a brief description, and several examples. And then at the bottom of the screen, we see a flow chart. We're actually going to start with the flow chart. The flow chart is going to help us decide what level of measurement would be applicable for various sets of data. And so we're going to take the levels of measurement, nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio, and we're going to fill them in across the bottom of our flow chart. So I have them moving left to right across the bottom, and then we're going to focus in on the flowchart. We'll come back and fill out the spreadsheet as well. But for the beginning, we're going to look at what questions do we need to ask ourselves in order to determine if data is nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio. And so in the chart, we're going to start with the top left. And at the top left, the question that we need to ask ourselves is, are the possible values numeric? So as we look at that question, that question can lead us straight down or lead us across. Now you'll notice the different weights of the lines in the flowchart. So this question box has just regular line, but this next box that it, if we go straight down, it has this really bold line, and that is an answer box. So are the possible values numeric? If we decide that they are not, so the answer to the question is no. That leads us straight down. And if that answer is no, then the data is qualitative. So in that bold box goes the word qualitative. However, you'll notice in this flowchart that there is another arrow coming to the qualitative box. So we want to look at what are the other ways to get to an answer of qualitative. So we're going back up to the top. Our very first question, are the possible values numeric? And so we might answer yes to that question. When we answer yes, we're going to move straight across. So this line is the answer of yes, and that takes us straight across. So the possible values might be values from a Likert scale. They might be measurements, all sorts of different things. But if they are numbers, we're going to move to the other side. And in this box, which has the lightweight line, we ask ourselves yet another question. Do the numbers have units? So if the numbers have units, things like milliliters, things like kilograms, things like centimeters, time is sometimes tricky because we don't think of time as having units, but it actually does. Is it AM or PM? If we're using the military time for the 24-hour system, it has hours. So we would say 1,300 hours for 1 PM. So all of those have units. But if the numbers do not have units, so if the answer to this question is no, then that's going to bring us back to qualitative data. So when we're looking at do the numbers have units, yes would take us straight down. We usually qualify the yes as they are measuring something. We're not going to get into this one quite yet. We're going to look at the no answer, because the no answer goes on this line. And the no answer takes us back to qualitative data. We're going to put a qualifier on this no, because it helps us to decide. And the no is really the number stand for something else. An example there would be a Likert scale. On a Likert scale, you may use 1 for totally disagree and 5 for totally agree. Those numbers have no labels, so they do not have units. Those numbers stand for something else, and number 1 stands for totally disagree. So if the numbers are not numeric or the numbers stand for something else, those are two ways to get to qualitative data. 
qualitative data, this beginning part of the word, it is describing a quality. Qualitative data in general is not numeric data but words. Now we do have this, that there could possibly be numbers, but numbers that stand for something else. So at this point we've decided our data is qualitative and we're going to go straight down and ask ourselves another question. So our next question, which allows us to determine if the data is nominal or ordinal, is do the values follow a natural order? If the answer to that question is no, we're going to go with nominal data. If the answer to that question is yes, we're going to call it ordinal data. So let me give you some examples. An example of nominal, I always think of nominal as being synonymous with name, and ordinal being synonymous with order, so the words actually sound like what they mean. So some things that have names to them. If we're asking gender, the categories have names of male and female. If we're asking ethnicity, the categories have names. If we're asking for blood type, the categories have names. None of those named categories have any order to them. If we have a gender of male or female, there's no one that comes first and one that comes second. No natural order. In the ordinal data, oftentimes there still are names or words because it is qualitative data. But there is a natural order. For example, if we're looking at the size of a soft drink, the choices would be small, medium, and large. There's a natural order. Medium always comes between small and large. We could put large first and go in descending amounts, or we could put small first and go in ascending amounts. But there is an order. Things like grades. We know that the highest grade is A. Even though A is a category name, we know that it comes as a higher grade than B. This would also be true of things like the Likert scale that I mentioned before. If we assign one as strongly disagree, two as somewhat disagree, three as neutral, there is an order. The opinion is increasing in favorability as the numbers go up. So now let's come back up the other side of our table. And here we have this yes. Our data had numbers and the numbers are measuring something. So if we answer yes to this question, we get a different type of data called quantitative data. The beginning word in quantitative here, this quant, is number. So we have numeric data. And again, once we've determined that our no data is numeric, we're going to ask ourselves a question to determine if it is interval data or ratio data. So that question is, does the data have a natural zero? If we answer no to that question, we get interval data. If we answer yes to that question, we have ratio data. Let me give you some examples to explain. If we answer no, something like the year, the answer to does the year have a natural zero is no. At year zero, there is still time. So we usually think of year zero as the separation between BC and AD, or we think of zero as the separation between BCE, before current era, and CE, the current or common era. But that year zero is still a time period, a mark in history. So that is interval data. When there is a natural zero, for example, if we're measuring length and the length is zero, that means there is no length. Zero is not just a number marking a spot on a continuum. It means the absence of length. Let's go through another example. Think about temperature. When it is zero degrees outside, there is still a temperature. 
and we know that if it gets colder, it goes into the negative degrees, there is still temperature. So zero is just a spot on that interval. It doesn't mean the absence of temperature. If we're measuring heart rate and we get zero beats per minute, then we're going to have ratio data because zero beats per minute means the heart is not actually beating. There are no beats. The beats do not exist. So that is a natural zero, a zero meaning the absence of the quantity, and that makes it ratio data. So now that we've made it down to the bottom of the flowchart, and we've classified the data as nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio, we want to go back to our table and fill in a little bit of a description and a bunch of examples on the four different types of data. So zooming in on the chart, first we have the nominal data. And what we want to say about the nominal data is that this is, has a name or categories. When we think about name or categories, it just makes sense, but I do want to note it here that we cannot do math with this, so there is no math. The math that we often do is subtraction when we're working with statistics, and it does not make sense to subtract something like male from female, so obviously no math. However, sometimes, as we talked about with the flow chart, there are numbers that are used. And so there is a temptation to do math, like do subtraction with the numbers, but we have to remember those numbers really represent categories. And so it does not make sense to subtract them. Let's talk about a couple examples. And so I listed a few here, things like a jersey number. So if you have kids on a soccer team and they all grab a jersey, each of them is assigned a number by that jersey. But that number just represents a child. The numbers make it easier for the coach on the other team to say, hey, look out for number five, without knowing the child's name. So even though they have a number, it does not make sense to do math with those numbers because the numbers truly represent the children, which are names. Same idea with your social security number. It's a number, but it represents you. You have a name. And then things like hair color and gender are obviously nominal. They are names for the categories, and there is no way that we would do math with those. So our next type of data is ordinal. And with ordinal, it is still qualitative data. So names are the most common thing that we would have here under description. And as we talked about on the other side, these tend to have an order. Still, there is no math that we do with these because it's still qualitative. So we should not be subtracting. We should not be computing an average. We should not be dividing. There's no math that we should be doing at all with these. Let's talk about a couple examples. One idea that would be ordinal is the rank of hospitals. So you see the US News and World Report. And for example, our hospital is a magnet hospital. It's a top 100 hospital. But a rank of one is not twice as good as a rank of two. Where a rank of four doesn't mean that hospital is only half as good as the second ranked hospital. All of our top 100 hospitals are separated by such small details. And so doing math with those rankings is not a great idea. Grades, we know the ABCD puts the grades in order. But we also know that it doesn't usually take twice as much effort to get an A as it does a B. So we don't want to be doing math with the grades. We don't want to subtracting them. Degree earned, things like associate's degree, bachelor's degree, master's degree, PhD, there is a natural order to them. There's no math we can do. They're words. Things like a Likert scale. We talked about this before, so strongly disagree gets a 1 somewhat disagree gets a two, etc. There is a natural order, and even though we're assigning numbers there, we should not be doing math with those numbers. Now, our next type of data is the interval data, and this was the other side of our flowchart. And this is quantitative data, so this is numeric data. We would describe interval data as 
numeric with no natural zero. And with interval data, we can do a little bit of math, so we can subtract, but not divide. So let's look at some examples. Year is an example, and we talked about that the year zero does not mean time has stopped. And so it makes sense to subtract years. If we take 1980 and 2000, there's a difference of 20. That difference is real. But it does not make sense to divide them. So if we take 1980 and divide by 2000, we'd get some decimal. 1980 is not that decimal of 2000. That doesn't make sense. Another example is time of day. Even at the hour of zero, which we associate with midnight, there is still a time, and that actually has meaning that's not the absence of time of day. And again, it makes sense to subtract, so if something starts at 8 a.m. and goes to 12 noon, we know that it has a four-hour duration, and that makes sense, but it does not make sense to divide. Temperature is another example there. Zero degrees is not the absence of a temperature. That has been arbitrarily designed assigned, we know that zero means different things if we're measuring in Celsius versus Fahrenheit. So obviously there is a temperature. We've just assigned zero. It's not a natural zero. And then our final type of data is the ratio data. And the ratio data, again, is numeric because it's on the quantitative side. And it does have a natural zero. The great thing with ratio data and the whole meaning of ratio is that we can divide. So for ratio data, we can subtract, just like we could with interval data. And we can divide. Let's look at some things that would be examples. So if we look at a person's height, so if we have a person that is 3 feet versus a person that is 6 feet, we can take 6 divided by 3 and say they are twice, two times as tall. Lengths, that's sort of similar to heights. Both would be measured in either centimeters or inches or feet. All of our rates, so milliliters per hour on our IV bags, um, miles per hour as far as speeds, things like blood pressure, anything that has a natural zero. All of these, if we think of what does zero mean, if your blood pressure is zero, you have no blood pressure. If your IV is running at zero milliliters per hour, it's not running. So the zero truly means that the, the absence of this quantity. Now, I mentioned that ratio is really telling us that we can divide. And what we have as a definition of a ratio in math is a fraction. And you know that a fraction represents division. So by calling it ratio data, we are literally saying this is where division works. When we think of interval data and telling these two apart, an interval is like time because it is on a continuum. And those, that is why we don't have that natural zero.